Well, we can uh, be going to Romans chapter 4 today. Romans 4, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. If you recall from our studies last week, we talked about Abraham and how he was not justified by works in the sight of God, but rather it was by faith. And now we turn our attention to David. Paul here, verse number 6 begins the right. says, Even as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. Here he begins by saying, even as David also described it, that is, the next two verses he'll be quoting from Psalms 32. We don't have to turn there, but it's almost a word for word quotation. But Paul seems to pick two of the most prominent Jewish figures to show the Jews and show us eventually how that justification is by faith and not by works. Amen. But he says, even as David also described it, the blessedness of a man. No. There is a great blessing in this teaching that we're looking at today. Mm. We'll, we'll see that in the two verses here that David describes as reasons we are blessed before God. And he says, but even as David also described the blessed of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without words. Mm -hmm. And just, that man is righteous before God without doing a single work that defies man's logic, doesn't it? Amen. You know, that God would place his righteousness on our account when we were really in fact unrighteous, when we had done no deeds to earn it, that also goes against the majority of religious teachings today. You know, and the Islam religion, you can, if you die a quote martyr's death, you're automatically forgiven and you can go to heaven. Mm. That's why they don't mind dying in jihad or holy war, as they call it. Right. Because in their eyes, they're dying for the cause of Islam. You got but Jehovah God, you cannot earn this state of righteousness by Amen. doing anything. As he says here, it's lost my spot, sorry. It says, God imputes righteousness without works. It's without us doing anything at all, God gives us righteousness. Amen. You know, this, some of the more advanced theological people might say this is the doctrine of imputation, that God is imputing our sins to Christ and imputing his righteousness to us. Amen. As we saw with Abraham, faith is all that God requires. And his faith was counted for righteousness. His, his faith was all that God required for him to be righteous in his sight. Amen. And really it's the same for us that we he only requires us to have faith. You, know, you don't want to stand before God having your own righteousness, but rather you want to be able to stand before God having the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Amen. Specifically by faith of Jesus Christ. Paul says that in Philippians 3 as well as in Romans 3. If you look back at verses 20 and 21 and 22 of Romans 3, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Amen. Again, how we have righteousness before God is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's not by anything that we do or anything that we can earn or not anything that we can purchase or anything like that, but rather just simply by faith in him, he says it's counted unto us for righteousness. And yet this goes against 
man's religions and man's logic and reasoning and man thinks he has to do something to be right before God. And yet the fact is, as we've seen over and over again here in Romans already, is that man cannot do anything to be right before God. That man cannot be justified by the deeds of the law or by works. Rather, our only hope is that God would justify us. Amen. Verse 7 here. Now he goes on say, saying, as he is now quoting from Psalm 32, and says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Mm -hmm. I thought about this word blessed for a minute. What does it mean? We say we're blessed all the time, but divinely favored is what it, the word blessed means, and it implies a state of happiness. Mm -hmm. Really, we are the most blessed people, though. therefore we should be the most happy people as well. I always remember Brother Rich saying, Christians always have faces long enough to drink buttermilk out of a churn, but we ought to be the most happy people. Amen. Because God has forgiven us, He has saved us, He has given us the righteousness of Christ, He has removed our guilt and sin. We have much that we are blessed about and much that we should be happy and thankful towards God about. But He says, Blessed are those, are they who iniquities are forgiven. Well, that our iniquities, our transgressions, our every violation of God's law has been forgiven mm -hmm. and remitted, omitted, it's been laid aside, it's been let go. Amen. God is the only one who can truly forgive sin. Now, we can forgive one another of transgressing against one another, doing each other wrong. In the sight of God, only God can forgive us of our sins. And it's more than just simply a, a get out of jail free card, as many try to make it out to be today. But certainly he he frees us from the penalty of sin, but he also frees us completely from that sin. Amen. Let's go over Psalms 103 for a moment. Psalm 103, verse 12. Here we see the result of our sin being forgiven. And most of today's lesson should be reminders from Adam's class if we've been paying attention. But mm -hmm. Psalm 103, verse 12, which we've already covered, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. See, he didn't just simply say, Well, you're free to go. And we completely removed it from our account. He says, The east is infinitely far away from the west. Mm -hmm. We live on a globe, contrary to what some people believe. And if you go north, you'll eventually cross the North Pole and start going south again. Right. You can go east as long as you want, and you'll always be going east. You can go west as long as you want, you'll always be going west. They're infinitely apart from, from another. Amen. And that's how far it says he has removed our transgressions from us. That they are completely removed from us, not to be brought up again. But they are, they weren't just set aside here just a little way. And if we don't live this right, that'll bring them up again. He's removed them far other ways that possibly could be. Amen. He says that not only have our iniquities been forgiven, he says our sins are covered. Our sins are covered. The last part of verse 7 says, with every wrongdoing, every transgression of the law has been covered by the blood of Christ. And 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is a transgression of the law. And James 4, 17 tells us, Him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it is sin. Amen. Sin is ultimately doing wrong, doing that which is not right. I think sometimes we only think of sin as violating the thou shalt not to the scripture, but they make it very clear that if we know to do good and we don't do it, that's sin as well. Amen. You notice here that 
He says those have been covered as well. You know, in the Old Testament, they had the sacrifices which covered their sins for a, a time, and then they've had to go and offer again. But Christ came and he covered them and removed them for eternity. He was once offered for sin. Amen. See, that's why we can turn to Psalms 85 and I think sometimes we we limit God to our view of things in time. Psalms 85. Verse number. Two says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, thou hast covered all their sin. See, the psalmist here could look forward in faith and know that God would cover their sin in time, but he bad. God is not bound by time. He has really, in essence, covered our sin from eternity past, but we just see that come to pass in the process of time. Amen. Revelation describes. Christ is a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But yet we know in the process of time it came to pass about 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we, just as the psalmist can say, our sins have been covered. And the psalmist here, I believe, it doesn't give anybody, but I assume it's David. David, by faith, could look forward and know that God was going to provide a permanent covering for sin. Mm -hmm. That Christ would take his blood and apply it in the holiest of holies in heaven and upon that mercy seat there and our sins will be covered forevermore. Mm -hmm. but, like I said, we see that come to pass in time. And the Old Testament, they had to do the sacrifices and then Christ would come and make that permanent, but yet it was really just as good as already done when David wrote that. Amen. That's why David could write, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man of the age whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Amen. Because even though, you know, for us, it, we had to wait till we were born and the Lord worked on our hearts and saved us by grace, but yet, in reality, we were as good as already saved when You're God right. created. You bet. Our sins are covered. I think sometimes we, I don't know, we think about how blessed the thought that is that God covered our sins and He's forgiven us of our iniquities. He said He didn't just give us a get out of jail free card, now we're free to go. Right. His justice, as we've seen before, requires penalty for sin. It requires a, a payment, if you will. Yet that he would not only provide that payment, but then forgive us completely of that sin. That he would by his own blood cover our sin. I think sometimes we think too lightly of that. And certainly God is a God of love and he displays that to us greatly. And yet he is we sometimes forget that he was also, or is also a God of wrath and Amen. judgment and justice. All those things were fulfilled in Christ and his sacrifice. Now we can say truly we are blessed that he has forgiven us of our iniquities and he has covered our sins. And we'll go on in verse 8, he'll say once again we're blessed. It's the same as verse 7, we're blessed, but this time he gives us another reason, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Amen. You know, there are, are some who will, maybe not in word, but in practice, will accuse God of imputing sin again in one's account. If you could lose your salvation, then, then your sin will be imputed to you again. But this very clearly says that he will not impute sin to certain people. To those who are saved, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Right. He doesn't say, blessed is a man whom the Lord will not keep sin if you do this or do that, does he? No, if you can be sure if you have been saved that God will not keep sin to your account anymore. That he will not charge you with sin any longer. All this falls under 
justification. I know we've been looking at a lot of justification, and Paul is covering that in great detail in the last, really, all the way through the book of Romans. But if you don't get justification right, you'll be off on a lot of other things. Amen. If you can be justified by your works, then your base for salvation will be off. If you can earn your justification by something you do, then it's not justification by faith anymore. Amen. It's up to you to join a certain church or to, to be baptized, and it's not God who is doing the justifying. But imputation, as it's called here, accounting to our account, that is the means by which we are justified. Like God takes our sin and places it on Christ. That's seen very clearly in Isaiah 53 that he bore our sins and our iniquities. Amen. Then that he takes his, the righteousness of Christ and applies it to our account. Then we can truly say we are justified. We are as one person said, just as if I had never sinned. Mm -hmm. It's no much more than just we are saved. It's that he has completely removed sin and the guilt of sin. And going on from that, he has given us righteousness and holiness in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is really the only way that we can stand right before God. You're right. God is not placing sin on our account any longer. That should be a blessed thought, shouldn't it? Amen. That though we fall, though we are, as long as we are truly born again, He is not going to charge us a sin any longer. And quoting from Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 10, 17 says, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He's not going to bring them up against us any longer. When we stand before God at the judgment, he's not going to say, well, you're guilty. You now go into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. But he has every, he could, if I can say this way, he, he would have every right to, because we still sin. Amen. Yet he, in his goodness and his grace and his mercy, has removed our sin from us, given us this righteousness, you can be sure you don't want to stand before God in your own righteousness because that will fall far short. Yet to have the righteousness of God applied by faith, that is the only way to stand before him. Mm -hmm. But none of this, here, before I get ahead of myself, let's go to Psalm 130 for just a moment. You know, our sins have been <laughs> forgiven, they've been covered, they've been removed. And so they'll be remembered no more. Psalm 130, verse number 3. He says, If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Mm -hmm. so for us that have been saved, he's not marking iniquity anymore. Amen. That's what he means here by Lord, not impute sin. He's not counting that against us any longer. But if he was, none of us would be able to stand literally. If he was saying, well, for Larry, he sinned here, and for the junior, he sinned over here, and he's keeping a tally of those things, none of us would be able to stand in his sight. You're right. Yet he's completely removed that from us. And yet none of that excuses our sin, though, does it? No, that is a license to sin. No, we will still give an account before God. I think Romans 14, 12, and 2 Corinthians 5, 10 make that very clear. Amen. That every man shall give an account of himself before God. And we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And, right. That we will give an account of the things done in this body, whether it be good or bad, or whether it be good or evil. Yet, if we've truly been saved by the grace of God, we will not stand guilty before him. Amen. We will not. It's not going to be that he's going to hand out a bunch of 
lollipops and suckers and participation trophies, but at the same time, he was not going to condemn any that are under the blood. Amen. I think sometimes we, it's hard to describe and understand in the carnal mind, but positionally, if I could say it, we are always going to be righteous if we are saved inside of God. We, That's it. We're always going to be free from sin inside of God. We hit. In our walk with God, we still sometimes fall short. We still sometimes fall to sin. We sometimes don't live up to the faithfulness which we should. And we will give an account for that. None of that will condemn us in the sight of God. Amen. That's really what we're leading up to. Eventually, in chapter number 8, we'll get there. Right there. Therefore, now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. and this, Slowly but surely, we're building up to that point here that because God has done it all, because He has justified us, He has saved us, He has forgiven us, He has removed our sin from us, He has given us righteousness, because of all of this, we will not stand condemned in the sight of God. Amen. And all these are reasons we can say that we are blessed. All these are reasons that we should rejoice as the people of God. I know this, this life sometimes gets difficult. We have trials and tribulations in this world. We, get, we have spiritually blessings beyond understanding. Mm -hmm. And those things ought to cause us to rejoice in Him. Those things ought to give us really hope, if you will, give us some spiritual energy to keep going on. Mm -hmm. That God has done so much for us that He is. I think it's hard for us to understand that we sinned against God, we transgressed His law, we violated His commands. We, in His sight, naturally speaking, we're vile and wicked and sinful and disgusting, even. That's right. Worthy of eternal separation from Him, and yet. In his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his love, he forgave us and he covered our sins and he removed our transgressions from us and no longer imputes that righteousness to us. He no longer counts that unrighteousness to us. He no longer counts sin towards our account. Rather, he's given us the righteousness of Christ, which is the perfect righteousness. It would have been enough of a blessing already if he just removed sin from our account. No, he went on farther to even give us righteousness and give us justification. With all that we should say with glory and praise to God because he has done it all. Amen. Well, there, if you really want to dive deep into it, saying that as Jonah did, salvation is of the Lord is a very deep subject. Mm -hmm. God has done, done it all. He doesn't require anything from us. He just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall we say. Amen. Yet today, man tries to do all these things on his own, doesn't he? He tries to do enough good works that he will outweigh his bad works, or he tries to do certain deeds that he thinks will appease God, and he tries to live a, you know, a good and pious life, thinking that that will be acceptable in the sight of God. For some, for some they get baptized, for some they join a certain church, for some they give money in hopes that they will be okay when they stand before God. We get salvation and justification really is so much more simple than all those things. Amen. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We don't have to, as far as salvation is concerned, we don't have to do anything at all. But Amen. He just says, have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will count that for righteousness. Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will remove your sins, and forgive your sins, and cover your sins. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, we should serve him. After that, we should dedicate our lives to God and 
try to follow his commands and do that which he says. But when it comes to salvation alone, all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And all these things flow from that. Justification, the righteousness of Christ, forgiveness of sins, removal of sin, the guilt of sin. And I think sometimes we don't think enough of that, do we? Right. So we that are saved, we ought to give God the thanks, give God the praise. Mm -hmm. And just consider how blessed we really are. And for those that aren't saved, so again, all I can do is point you to Christ and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You're right. And you can experience these same blessings and benefits. But if you stand before God in your own self, you will be far short of all the requirements of God. They can only be met to the person of Christ. Lord, well, next week we'll just go turn back to Abraham for a minute and show how that all this isn't just for the Jews, but it's also for us. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and close with that.